Bidirectional charging, the idea that electric vehicles can be used as energy storage, and all the half-truths and false promises that are often conveyed to us out of ignorance during consultations when buying an electric vehicle. A warm welcome to today's episode on this topic and to another video on this YouTube channel. By now, it definitely happens to me every day that my customers, subscribers, channel members, or even people I don't know contact me because they've decided to get an electric vehicle and confront me with the question, Hey Alex, I just bought an electric vehicle that supports bi-directional charging. I saw that you have the corresponding wall box in your online shop. Is this compatible with my vehicle? When I tell these folks, that's my personal wall box, which is basically supported by the infrastructure, but your specific vehicle simply can't do it, it almost always turns into an endlessly protracted discussion. And every single time, it costs me valuable time and significant nerves to explain to each individual person precisely why, and there's truly no other way to put it, in Europe, except for France. It's simply not yet adequately provided for, and that's precisely why the whole thing doesn't just effortlessly work that easily. The emphasis is on not that easily, because I've already demonstrated several times how I can use my Tesla or any electric vehicle as a power storage device. But not through the so-called vehicle to home function, and certainly not through the vehicle to load function, because my VW Charan already had that feature 15 years ago. Instead, I use a somewhat more cumbersome method, but one that definitely always works. There's also the question of whether you should really misuse the most expensive component of a vehicle for something it wasn't actually designed for, and whether it wouldn't make more sense to purchase a power storage unit that's specifically designed and suitable for your needs from my online shop. The link is in the video description below. What exactly the problem is, which regulatory hurdles are once again making our lives difficult, and why your so-called vehicle to home which in reality isn't one at all, in your Cupra Born, your VW ID5, your Nissan Leaf, your Skoda Enyaq, or whatever it's called, is just nonsense and won't really help you. That's what today's episode is all about. If you're interested in all this and want to learn more about these topics, you can, if you like, support my work by becoming a channel member. That helps me invest more time into this YouTube channel. You can do it, but you don't have to. But in any case, now would be the perfect time during the intro to scroll down, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications. I'm Alex. Let's get started. All right. But what exactly does bidirectional charging or vehicle to home mean, which some vehicles supposedly already support? At least if you believe all the sales consultants who tell their customers this every day. Bidirectional charging means that we don't just feed electricity into the battery of our electric vehicle, but we can also draw that energy back out. And ideally, this should happen through the same charging port that is used to charge the vehicle. And I'm not sure if that's actually clear to everyone. There are several ways to charge an electric vehicle. If you charge at a public charging station or a Tesla supercharger, which rarely happens for me since I charge at home 95% of the time. So in places where it's usually faster than at home, meaning with more than 11 or a maximum of 22 kW, the battery is charged with DC, that is direct current. But if you charge your car at home, for example, with the Solax electric vehicle charger or an alternative wall box, then it doesn't happen with direct current, but with AC, that is alternating current. And at a maximum of 22 kW, depending on which wall box you have and how fast your vehicle can actually charge with alternating current. But I don't know of any wall box for home use at a reasonable price, although Solax is apparently developing one now, as the colleagues have said, that charges the vehicle with DC, that is with direct current. And just as there are differences when it comes to charging, there are also differences with bi-directional charging, meaning when electricity is drawn from the vehicle again. 
Important, we're now starting with the option that has, in theory, been possible with many vehicles for quite some time. An option that, in theory, also works, even if we don't have a PV system at all. And this is actually what is always referred to as vehicle to home. Or, to be precise, the more advanced version is called vehicle to grid. We'll leave that aside for now, because that's about a bit more. But even with vehicle to load, it's important to understand that an inverter built into the vehicle is used to provide us with alternating current. Ideally, at 230 volts and a frequency of 50 or 60 hertz, depending on where we are. And if a vehicle fully supports vehicle to load, we can conveniently connect an electrical load or a specific device directly to a dedicated socket which is usually and thoughtfully built into the vehicle itself. But with this, except perhaps in certain cases in off-grid single-phase operation, we can't supply our household in grid parallel mode because this power is not synchronized with the public grid. Or rather, this inverter cannot synchronize with it. For it to effectively do this, it absolutely must possess the inherent ability to seamlessly synchronize itself with the public electrical grid. And if it can successfully accomplish that, then we are already talking about the advanced concept of vehicle to home, V2H technology. So with vehicle to home, the inverter built into the vehicle is used to synchronize with the public power grid in the respective supply area so that when needed and based on appropriate control, it can provide three-phase alternating current to supply the consumers in our household. And the wall box, such as the new electric vehicle charger from Solax, specifically the HAC version that supports bi-directional charging, does nothing more than give the command to the vehicle or the inverter built into the vehicle to do this. That means the wall box, because it communicates with our Solax three-phase hybrid inverter. For example, if we need electricity from the grid because the sun has already set, it tells the vehicle, hey, now you give me seven kilobollars because Alex needs it right now for cooking while his sweetheart is once again sitting in the sauna. And the vehicle's inverter delivers this power, provided that seven kW isn't already too much. As a result, and this is exactly the problem, the vehicle becomes a power generator and therefore must also be recognized as such by the respective grid operator. In other words, it has to be listed in the grid operator's approved device list, just like our Solar X3 hybrid inverter, or at least be tested and included accordingly, but that's not the case. Because once again, the vehicle manufacturers and the grid operators can't come to an agreement or for some political reason, it's simply not provided for again. And that's why many car manufacturers are now trying to take a detour, which actually isn't a dumb idea at all, and they're making things easier for themselves. Because now they're saying, this whole thing isn't our concern. We don't care about the ability to synchronize our inverter in the vehicle with the power grid. We simply output DC direct current from the vehicle. And now the customer is supposed to figure out for themselves what to do with it. But that, that's not vehicle to home period. Because with direct current, I can't just supply power to our household. It first has to be run through a certified inverter for it to work at all. And that's exactly where there's a problem with this approach as well. The solution would be to use a wall box with an integrated inverter, ideally one that both charges the vehicle with DC, that is direct current, and draws DC back out of the vehicle, converts it into alternating current, synchronizes with the public grid, and feeds alternating current into our home network. The catch is that such a device doesn't exist at a reasonable price that is also approved in Austria or Germany, or at least I'm not aware of any. If you know of one, please let me know in the comments below. And for this reason, you can simply write off the whole thing in its current form. It doesn't work, neither with one approach nor the other. And that's exactly why it makes much more sense to get a power storage unit that's suitable for your needs, ideally, once again, from my online shop.
That way, you not only have a working system, but also my personal support. As always, a little self-promotion. But since I couldn't let it go and was curious, I still found a solution that now works perfectly. How you can use any electric vehicle as a power storage unit. And what I'm about to show you, or rather tell you, you really shouldn't try to copy, okay? That's important. At best, if you make a mistake doing this, you could lose your warranty. At worst, the whole car could blow up in your face. There's a risk to your life. So once again, please, do not try to copy what I'm doing. I realize that the heater in my Tesla is powered by 400 volts, and in theory, can deliver up to 6 kilowatts. So, I installed a tap on the supply line of my heating system, which allows me to connect a cable that, for now, I've temporarily run down into the basement. Once again, through the well-known dog door, which I have to thank my ex-wife for, or rather, the ex-dog, there's a charge controller connected to this cable now. In reality, it's actually a laboratory power supply, which I can both integrate into the home assistant and use to condition my direct current in such a way that it simulates the power curve of a PV module string. Then, via a certified Solax X3 string inverter, in this case, it's a small Solax mic, but you could use any MPP tracker for this, I feed the output of my laboratory power supply directly into the MPP tracker of the inverter. The control for this, how could it be otherwise, runs once again by a home assistant. When needed, the heater in my Tesla is activated, which by the way, is also part of my smart home. The grid activity is transmitted to the laboratory power supply. Depending on the grid activity, the laboratory power supply, controlled via home assistant, as mentioned, draws just enough power from the vehicle so that, within the limits of what's possible, my smart meter once again shows zero grid activity. However, this is only possible up to a maximum of six key dollars. Anyone who wants to can come and take a look at it at my place, but I definitely advise against trying to copy what I've done. So please, don't do this. But maybe this is an idea that might interest vehicle manufacturers. Because if you simply provide an additional connection with 200 to 400 volts DC directly on the vehicle, then anyone with some basic knowledge of electrical engineering could set the whole thing up themselves. 200 to 400 volts, because that's the ideal voltage range for the MPP tracker of the Solax X3 hybrid inverter. By the way, many of you are probably wondering, why is he wearing glasses today? It's simple. I got these because they especially help me when driving at night on wet roads. I got them from Butcher Optic Shopping City Zyersburg. The folks there took hours to measure my old eyes and see what was still possible. And as you can see, I look like I'm 29 again. And now I can see at least just as well. So I can highly recommend Butcher Optic. That's it for today, and we'll see each other again in the next video. 